morning again. And good morning to all of you that I didn't get a chance to say good morning to. The scripture we just heard, some of you will remember. That was our subject of last week. The Apostle Paul writing in for, uh, to the church in, uh, to, to the, Timothy, who was at the church in Ephesus, gives him certain instructions, and in the middle, he stops to thank Christ Jesus for the tremendous gift of grace that he was given, and the immense patience that Jesus has for him, and because he considered himself of being the worst of them all, for anybody, everybody that Jesus died for. Prior to that, he had given Timothy some instructions, and after that, he continues the instructions. Before we get to that, just wanted to mention we are now in part three of our uh, sermon series, and we're calling it Reboot, Life-Changing Challenges from Paul's Letters to Philemon and Timothy. The first one was in Philemon, and Pastor Jeff uh, brought that one, talking about the fact that we really need to re uh, focus on reconciliation of our relationships. Last one, we talked about remembering to regret. That's what Paul, he was regretting still, after all these years, what he had done. But those regrets enabled him to appreciate so much more the grace that Jesus had given him. Today we have part three, and so we want to get started first before we get to the passage we'll be going into, which is in 1 Timothy chapter 2. First we want to um, begin with chapter 1 and kind of review what we had before. So if you have your Bibles want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to see again the instruction that Timothy was given because this instruction is for us as well. He writes to Timothy, for chapter 1, verse 3, to begin with, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines or any, any longer, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Or as he said when he wrote to the church in Galatia, uh, he called it faith expressing itself in love. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to te be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. And then he went on. And then he, we heard what we heard today. But before we go further, let's go back to this goal. This is the beginning of the letter. This is the focus of the letter. And the church in Ephesus back then was no different than we at Centerpoint are today. The goal is Centerpoint's goal as well. And that is that we ha have love as the result of a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Now when I think about myself. And I think about what Paul wrote. And I see too those things that I remember to regret. And some of the things regrets I have even happened this week. Things I say. Things I don't do that I should do. And I know I should and so on. How do we get a pure heart? How can we make sure our conscience is good? And our faith is sincere. Not just going through the motions. Not just coming to church because that's what we do. That's our goal. That's what the goal that he wanted Timothy to grasp and help the people in Ephesus to come to see. Because they were getting all involved in all kinds of other stuff that was going on in society. As we so easily do. So we drop down to verse 18 after he, he had expressed what he did and we heard in the scripture reading. He went back to what he was saying to Timothy. I put this charge, which was in verse 3, this charge before you, Timothy, my child, in keeping with the prophecies once spoken about you, in order that with such encouragement you might fight the good fight. We all want to fight the good fight. 
we all want to lay hold on eternal life, which is how he concluded the letter. To do this, you must hold firmly to the faith, to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck in regard to the faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. To fight the good fight of faith, he says, we've got to hold firmly to faith and a good conscience. How do we do that? How strong is your faith? How good is your conscience? Or, even as he went further in the earlier passage, uh, uh, beginning of the letter, how pure is your heart? Now, when I'm asking you this question, and I'm pointing this finger, you know what my, my mom always taught me. I point a finger at you. You got three pointing back at me. This is for us. Just like it was for Timothy, so that Timothy could pass it on to the church in Ephesus. This is for us. And what we're going to talk about today is something I never got. So it's new for me, too. We're all on this together. But it's extremely important. It will make all the difference. Our passage today is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And where we see the key to Timothy's and our ability to fight the good fight. And that is in prayer. But not just any kind of prayer. But the right kind of prayer. The title of today's message is Prayer That Makes a Difference. And that's what we want to talk about today. Because that's what Paul pointed out to Timothy. That that's where we begin. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll kind of go through, some, through this and comment as we go. 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, our passage is verses 1 through 7, and we'll just begin with verse 1 and kind of I'll walk us through it in the time that we have. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I urge you first of all, before anything else, this is of utmost importance, this is where it all starts, to pray for all people. You know, I've read this passage many times. And every time I've read the passage, I know it's told me to pray for our leaders. And I've prayed for the presidents I've liked and forgotten to pray for the ones I didn't. And others along the line. But this is not what it says. Our leaders are here, but they're incidental. Pray for all people. What, what difference would that make in your life and in my life if we actually prayed for everyone? Now you're asking what I was asking when I first read this and realized that's what it says. How do you do that? We want to talk about that a little bit today. But this is a journey we want to start. Center Point Church can make the, a huge difference in our community, not only among ourselves, in our community, in Grove City, in central Ohio. We can make a huge difference around the world because you have all, you know, peace, peace, well, many of you on Facebook and, and stuff like that, our, our, our influence reaches out a lot farther now. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Here's, here's a note that was in the Message Study Bible on this passage. It says, in order to be effective, prayer has to be the first thing that we do, not the last. You know how sometimes it is when everything else fails, we pray? But it has to be the first thing, not the last. We begin with prayer in order that all our other actions may be directed rightly. When we have prayed, we'll have greater spiritual sensitivity. We'll be in touch with the energy that will equip us to move and to minister. First of all, pray, Paul wrote. Then let the prayer spread out, reaching all people, even kings, even those we don't like, even the people who are against us. They were in a world where that was more and more the case. He had just been released from prison and would be back again in a very short time. A changed world.
we pray. I never read this the way I should either. Pray for, did you get that? Pray for, now I've prayed about a lot of folks and a lot of things. But when I prayed about, it hasn't always been a good prayer. I've prayed about what this person did and what that person did. Now, I've prayed for me. I do that every day, all the time. And now I'm reading, well, maybe that's kind of incidental. Me becomes incidental when I've got everybody else to take care of first. But if I take care of everybody else first, God will take care of me. Hmm. Pray for. And then it says, pray for all. Or otherwise, uh, another way you can say it is pray for everyone. Even, now we go to verse 2. Pray this way, he says. And, and the NET translation in, 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 introduces the word even here. Pray this way, even for kings and all who are in authority. So that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Very important there to pray for our leaders because they can make decisions that will affect our ability to serve God in the way that it would be best for everyone. However, there's some things we've got to look at there too. Don Ratzlaff and the Christian leader made this comment. This was a, an article way back in 1993, but it's just as true today. He says, if Jesus is Lord, then he must also be Lord of our politics. That is an unarguable Christian truth that everybody argues about. Too many of us Christians confuse political convictions with spiritual convictions. Insecure with ambiguity, we assume people of one Lord, one faith, and one baptism must also promote one political agenda. That assumption leads the church into trouble. First, it prompts us to make judgments about people that ought to be left to God. Second, when the church confuses spiritual and political convictions, it is tempted to use political power to forward a spiritual agenda. God doesn't work that way. Jesus works the opposite way, as we know. And therefore, it's very easy. I think that's very likely what was going on in Ephesus at the time when Paul was writing Timothy and saying, hey, you got stuff going on there. It's not good. Help them, focus them on love. That's the goal through a, a pure heart, from, caused by a pure heart, a clear conscience or a good conscience and faith, sincere faith. That's what we work on. That's what we, is important. And then he tells them, first and foremost, to go in that direction. We need to begin to pray. And pray for all the people we've been talking about instead of uh, praying for. So he says here, this, uh, this uh, prayer for all, going down to verse 3, this prayer for all is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. God cares about each human being alive today and who has ever lived and all those who will live going forward. That's what he's about. That's what this whole creation is about. That's what Jesus was about when he came and is about now after he paid all the price for the sins and, and are going the wrong way. And so Paul says, there is, for there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. That's why two weeks ago we were talking about reconciling relationships. That's what Christ does. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world just at just the right time. And I... <clears throat> Excuse me, and I've been chosen as a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating, just telling the truth. So why do we need to pray this way for everybody? 
And I realize just talking about it this way is overwhelming. It has been for me this week. How do you do that? Now, in the one case, if we read carefully, we realize it doesn't say at the same time. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's not the object of the game. I think the object of the game is to be able to say no to the question, is there anybody I would ever come in contact with or know about that I would not be willing to pray for? Not pray about, pray for. That's where we have, what we have to get to. There was nobody and never has been anybody that Jesus wasn't willing to die for. So we need to pray this way because God loves everyone and wants everyone to be saved. And why do we come to church? We want to learn what God, what we want to learn to want what God wants. And as Paul said, he wants love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, because that describes the mind of Jesus. And that's the kind of mind we can begin to, with his help, develop if we are willing to pray for anybody we come in contact with at any time of the day, and even if you wake up, even at night. We'll go into that. Tell you how you can do that, too. So, okay. How do we pray for someone? Not just about. Paul explained it. He said, ask God to help them, number one. That is the first thing. You see somebody who needs help? Might be in the grocery store. Might be somebody who's having difficulty either paying their bills or, or carrying the thing or whatever it may be. Uh, somebody who you sense needs God's help, and that is one thing. You, others you may be able to do too, but you can pray for that person. Ask God to help them. Another way, he says, intercede on their behalf. Now, interceding, that's what Christ does for us. He says, Father, they're weak. They, they, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. They don't get it, you know. That's what we can do when somebody does something that we realize is wrong, either toward us or in other ways. Intercede on their behalf. Father, forgive them. Help them. They don't, they don't understand. That's the best way, in some ways, to play, pray for our leaders. Or, then he goes on to say, and... Give thanks for them. If I'm thanking God for somebody, it's kind of hard for me to say something bad. I've come to appreciate that person. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 17, uh, um, James wrote, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. Anything good that a person does that I can see in that person because everybody is made in the image of God, God's image is tarnished in all of us. But through Jesus Christ living in us, that can change. And as we learn how to walk in this way, and therefore we can learn to appreciate where God's uh, image is being reflected in others as well, even in their weakness, just like in ours. How do you pray for somebody? One person said, Ask for others what you are praying for yourself. I never ask God for bad things for me. Matter of fact, I'm pretty good at kind of encouraging him to go in a certain direction. I can do that for somebody else as well. They need just as I do. Another person wrote and said, we never pray for folks we gossip about. I think that's true. And we never gossip about the folk for whom we pray. If I'm praying for somebody, I'm not prone then to tell everybody about what they've done because I've put them in God's hands. So, okay. I can't tell you to do this. 
because I even can't tell me to do this. I need to decide this is what I want to do. But let's say we choose, let's go this route. And we begin to walk and live our lives as it used to be written in the old book, practicing the presence of God. God is with us. I see somebody, I talk to him about that person in whatever situation, wherever we are. What will be the result of that in your life and in mine? Romans chapter 12, all these are writings from Paul. You can just jot it down. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, we know it. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. So that is what we're doing when you say, I am going to pray for everybody. Now, we may not do it as well as we want, but we can learn. And Paul says, this is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know God's uh, will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How, he's changed, how does he change the way I think? He transformed me, and as I begin to see people more positively and I'm praying for them, and it's, I'm for you, God is for you, I am for you, and I'm going to pray for you, or I'm going to intercede on their, your behalf. You shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to ask God to help you and, and, and forgive you. I'm going to thank God for you. Now, I might not be talking to people that way, but that's the mindset I want to develop and I practice it day in and day out. And the Spirit of God begins to transform me because I begin to think differently. And I begin to think more the way he thinks. So that as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, and Paul said this, so we, followers of Jesus, have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. It begins with how you think. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. What a gift. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. That's what Paul said, right? This is good. God wants everybody to be saved and come to understand the truth. God loves them. He wants a relationship with them. He wants to be with them forever. He wants to bless them. God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them. That's why I can intercede, and I know God will hear that prayer, and I know God will do what needs to be done in the life of that person so that person one day can really be reconciled to God. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation, Paul said. Okay. Here's the question. Where can we start praying for everyone? I say we now. I hope you're in this with me. Where are we going to start? Well, first of all, I say right here in this room. Look around. Here's where we start. We're blessed every week to get a list of people who we can be praying for. And as we get to know each other better, and we need to try to do that, even COVID kind of has kept us apart, we want to start getting together more. We want to start in two weeks with our picnic where we can spend time together, enjoy one another's company, get to know one another better than we have. Have fun. And the more we get to know each other, the better we can pray for each other. There are certain things that you 
might be doing this week and you tell somebody else and they know and they're praying for you at the time that that's going to happen, things like that. But as we get to know each other better and, and love each other more, we realize, okay, we're here to bless our neighbors, which I will call, just for now, Emersonia, okay? And so we want to get to know our neighbors better. What are their needs? Some of our neighbors here can help us to know what our neighborhood needs as far as God's help and prayer and where we might be able to be helpful and get to know them better. That's why even sending invitations, taking them out, anybody, they're all welcome. Anybody is welcome to come to the picnic. And it would be great then if we could do our part by signing up. And if you see, we already have 14 uh, uh, um, potato salads. Well, then why don't you bring an egg salad or something like that, you know? Okay. Isn't that, isn't that what you said? We did want 17 only... Uh, uh, something along that line. Okay. Okay. But then we can do it wherever we are. We can see people, see their need, and pray. This reminds me of people that I've known for years, two sisters, live in southern Ohio, attend Voice of Hope, Chillicothe. They've been in part of this church all their life. They're getting older now, quite poor, very poor health. And because they're in very poor health, they're going to doctors a lot, getting treatment a lot, uh, seeing a lot of other people in the same situation. I've been a part of that congregation for what now? 12, 9, 5, 27 years. And I don't think I'm exaggerating to say at least once every one or two weeks, maybe more, we get prayer requests from them about people who need prayer. And so they're going around the congregation. Everybody, you know, gets pray for such and such, or this is going on. And, and prayer requests are going out a couple times, two, three times a week sometime. And off it's these two. They can't do much else, but they can pray for everybody. And they have been kind of the example for us. Um, it's just been a wonderful thing. In conclusion, boy, did that smile ever get big on your face when I said that. <laughs> In conclusion, just a few thoughts. This came from uh, um, a, uh, an article in Heart to Heart uh, uh, in Today's Christian Woman, which is a magazine, and the writer wrote this. This is for you folks, how you can pray at night when you're in bed. You ready? I recently wrote to a close friend explaining that I had problems sleeping at night. When her next letter arrived, I learned that she, had, has, she has this problem as well, but uses her wakefulness to pray for loved ones, listing her prayer concerns alphabetically by first names. Now as I drift off, lovingly I pray for Adriana, for Alan, Amelia, and Amy. I feel surrounded by loved ones and I smile. I'm not just counting sheep, I'm counting his sheep. Just an idea, one way. It has been said, and I think it's true, the penalty for not praying, of not praying, is the loss of one's capacity to pray. Initially, it may be, if, I'm, if you're not used to, as I will admit, I'm not used to praying as, so much for other people as I should have been. I'm finding it's a little bit of a challenge. Go beyond, oh, help them. God, do this. God, you know, send God out to take care of stuff instead of really sensing a care for this person and focusing on them. But as the more we do it, the more we learn how, the more it becomes part of who we are. And we're walking and talking with God all day about people that he loves and we're learning to love as well. And then finally, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book Life Together wrote this. 
A Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members for one another, or it collapses. I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he causes me. His face, that hitherto may have been strange and intolerable to me, is transformed in intercession into the countenance of a brother for whom Christ died, the face of a forgiven sinner. This is a happy discovery for the Christian who begins to pray for others. And that is our challenge from the Apostle Paul to Timothy and the church in Ephesus and all of us at Center Point Church in Grove City, Ohio. The key to Timothy's and our ability to fight the good fight is in prayer. Not in any, just any kind of prayer, but the right kind of prayer. And by learning to pray for everybody, you and I will be praying prayers that make a difference, especially in ourselves. Let's pray. Our Father, now we, uh, we thank you for your word. And you know, sometimes we've been reading it for years and years and years, and things can go right over our heads, and then suddenly you show us this is what you intend. For me, and I think for many of us, that is what this second chapter of 1 Timothy is all about. It's about all the people you love, that you don't want anyone to perish. You want everyone to come to repentance. You want everybody to come to understand who you are and how much you love them. And you have given us that ministry of reconciliation, that opportunity to help people to know how wonderful you are, because just as Paul saw how wonderful you were to him, you've been that way to us as well. We have not deserved your goodness. They don't either. But that's not what it's all about. You have given all of us that forgiveness. I pray that you would be with each and every one here. And help us as we have heard your message, all of us, myself first and foremost, to take it to heart and to apply it in our lives every day. It'd be a challenge at first, but the more we do, the more the re remainder of the congregation will be blessed as well. And then Emersonia will be blessed. And then Central Ohio will be blessed in all the world because you can do all these things through your people as we yield to you. Thank you for your love for us all. Bless Center Point, bless Emersonia, and may you be honored and glorified by our lives and our love for you and for everybody else expressed through prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join me for one, one last song together today.